Well, welcome back, everyone. We're going to move into our final keynote of the day, if we could start taking our seats. Hopefully you enjoyed great food, and as Father Brian Gross talked about, great fellowship and community with, your, with people you haven't seen in a long time. It was great to see so much visiting in Exhibit Hall D. And so we're in for a treat this afternoon. Our third keynote is titled The Eucharist, Magic or Mystery, from Monsignor James Shea. Monsignor Shea was inaugurated in 2009 as the sixth president of the University of Mary, and at the age of 34, became the youngest college or university president in the United States. The oldest of eight children, Monsignor Shea grew up on a dairy and grain farm near Hazleton, North Dakota. Monsignor Shea has done and been blessed to do a lot in his life. He's worked with Mother Teresa's missionaries of charity and served as chaplain for the Bambino Jesus Children's Hospital in Rome. He also served as chaplain at St. Mary's Central High School when he was first ordained, which is where I received the proud honor of first getting to know him and to begin to understand just how gifted he is in so many different ways. Monsignor Shea is a Knight Commander of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem and serves on the Board of Directors for FOCUS, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. He's served on the National Advisory Council to the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops and is a member of the Executive Committee for the Board for the Association of Benedictine Colleges and Universities. There are so many things I could say about this man and could go on and on and he wouldn't like that one bit. But I will close with this. Monsignor Shea is a true father to so many people in this region and beyond, and he is a priest who loves Jesus very much and finds his strength in the Eucharist and who models Christ for us at our university and in so many other places on this globe that you can't hear enough about. And so I'm very blessed to be around his forward thinking in so many different ways all the time. Please help me welcome to the stage Monsignor James Shea. Thanks so much. Ruben. Let's start with prayer, everybody. Let's call upon the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O heavenly ruler, comforter, spirit of life, who are everywhere present and fill all things, O treasury of blessing, giver of life, fire of God's love, father of the poor, come. Come dwell within us, enlighten, guide, strengthen, defend, and console us. Cleanse us of all stain and save our souls, O gracious Lord. Mary, Mother of the Eucharist. Well, everybody, thanks for coming to the Eucharistic Conference of the Diocese of Bismarck. Uh, last week, we had the diaconate ordination. Bishop Kagan ordained two new deacons for the diocese, and Father Gross and Shelley Presler and I were all at the party afterward at the University of Mary. We were talking, and we thought, nobody's going to come not to hear us. And so we had a backup plan. We were going to go over to the Presler's house and uh, drink wine and smoke cigars all day long. But wow, Shelly and Father Gross opened us in an amazing way. Shelly, that's wonderful. You're like a rose between thorns. <laughs> Shelly said at the beginning of her talk, she said, if you 
have come here to hear doom and gloom, you've come to the wrong talk. But if you want hope, you've come to the right talk. I want to tell you this, if you want hope, you should have gone to Shelley's talk. <laughs> this is the talk for doom and gloom. And you need it to stay awake after lunch. The doom and gloom has to do with the whole cause or the impetus of the Eucharistic revival in our country. Our bishops took a look at a Pew Research study that was done in 2017, 2018, and they saw that belief in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist among Catholics has absolutely collapsed. That we are in a bad, bad way. That the vast majority of people who call themselves Catholic do not believe what the church teaches about Jesus' real and substantial presence in the Eucharist. And I do have to begin by saying that it's much, much worse than what they said. Not just because the Pew Research study was done in 17 and 18, and that things have certainly gotten worse spiritually and culturally since then, but also because many of the people who answered the questions on that study in the right way, saying that they believe what the church teaches, probably don't quite. Things are worse, they are worse than what we think. Now, there are many different reasons for that. When I became a Eucharistic preacher for the Eucharistic revival, I got letters from all kinds of people. A lot of them say, said to me, you've got to tell all of the priests that they have to be clearer about what the church teaches. There's not clarity of teaching. I think that there's a point to that. Others wrote to me and said, we need to have more reverence in our worship. We're too casual around God and the things of God. And we need to be much more reverent and reverence in worship would, would, would revivify and rejuvenate and renew the faith of Catholics in the Lord and the Eucharist. And I think both of those things, clarity in teaching and reverence in worship are absolutely needful. But there's a deeper problem there's something uh, that's afoot in our culture itself which makes it difficult for us, even more difficult than for people in past ages to believe the church's teaching about the Eucharist. Now part of it has to do with an intellectual error of not knowing the difference between magic and science and mystery, which is what I was originally going to speak about today and what the title of my talk in the program says. And I could say quite a, a bit about that. There are some interesting things having to do with intellectual history and the Enlightenment, the scientific revolution, uh, magic, and Isaac Newton, and all of those things that we could go into. But I want to sort of go in a little bit of a different direction to another one of the deep root causes that touches upon each and every single one of us who breathe in the air of the modern world. This past week, as I've done for many, many years, I was at new staff training for Focus. So I spend two days teaching all of the new missionaries for Focus about the classical Christian vision of the human person, about Catholic anthropology. And we talk about the different faculties of the human person, that each of us as human persons consist in or are comprised of different faculties. We have powers in our soul that make us unique and that mean that we bring together, human beings bring together the whole of the cosmos in our being. And so we have two higher faculties, the intellect and the will. The intellect allows us to know the truth. Our will allows us to love and to desire. That's the classical understanding of the heart when we say, put your whole heart into it, we're talking about the will. These higher faculties, the intellect and the will, we share with God and the angels. They are what make us persons. There are divine persons, angelic persons, demonic persons, and human persons. We fall into the realm of personhood because we have intellect and will, the higher faculties. And then there are the lower faculties, emotion, and sense, what the scriptures call the passions. 
And we share emotion and sense with the irrational animals because we ourselves also are animals. We're rational animals, but we bridge together the whole thing. What happens, according to Christians, according to the teaching of the Jewish and the Christian scriptures, according to the teaching of the Catholic faith, what happens is that in the fall, by our rebellion against God, our faculties, all of our faculties become weakened and diseased and distorted. And we suffer deeply, we are wounded in need of healing, redemption, and restoration. And so because of the fall, our intellect, which is our highest faculty, becomes darkened. It's supposed to know the truth, but now it doesn't, or it's hard for it to know the truth. It's easily prone to error and lies, susceptible to them. Our will becomes weakened, not able in a sturdy and steady way to choose that which is good. And our lower faculties, our emotions and our senses get inflamed, they begin to throb, and then they rise up and they overthrow our higher faculties so that we're ruled by them, ruled by emotion and sense, when the emotion and sense are meant to serve the intellect and the will. And this is the effects of the fall within us. And as a result, we become forgetful of our deepest destiny. And we forget that we are more than animals. This then is a fundamental cause of the collapse of belief among Catholics and a collapse in the capacity of humanity to believe what the church teaches about Jesus' presence in the Eucharist. Not simply clarity, yes clarity, but not simply clarity. Not simply reverence and worship, yes, but not simply that but it's that we just want to be animals. And I want to talk about that a little bit. That desire just to be animals has been around for a long time. It was called in the ancient world hedonism. Hedonism comes from the Greek word for pleasure. That the whole purpose of human life is just to lunge after pleasure. It's the philosophy of Woodstock of 1969. If it feels good, do it that our lives are just meant to be a kind of endless search for physical pleasure. But there's a kind of refined sense to hedonism which has taken a grip upon our culture and encouraged us to be content with living just like animals. This is Epicureanism, which is a kind of hedonism. It's the followers of Epicurus who said that we should espouse the philosophy of the good life. That what life is all about, because we don't have a spiritual nature, is maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. Now, Father Gross this morning spoke about St. Ignatius of Antioch and said that those who are children of this world cannot give themselves to Jesus Christ. The early Christians had a fair amount of respect for many of the philosophies of the ancient world. St. Justin Martyr, whose feast day was yesterday, said that he, he came to Christianity because he saw it as the true philosophy. So there was respect for people like Plato and Aristotle and Zeno and the Stoics. But people like Ignatius of Antioch and all the early Christians had nothing but contempt for the Epicureans who saw that there was no spiritual realm, that there were no higher faculties, that we were just meant to live by our lower faculties. And here's our difficulty, everybody. We have become a nation of Epicureans. We live according to pleasure. And it's much more refined. It's not just the wild days of Woodstock. We want comfort. We want a comfortable home. We want air conditioning in the summer and heat in the winter. We want an easy life. We want an interesting job with interesting friends. We've got bucket lists. We've got things that we need to check off of our bucket list. We want to take beautiful, elegant, interesting vacations. We live as Epicureans. Now, all of our faculties are good, including our senses 
and our emotions, but all of us have to be redeemed. Okay, now would you like a little hope? What Jesus does in the Eucharist is meant to be a direct answer to all of our bodily cravings. So we know, we know more than the Epicureans of old were the new Epicureans, and we know more than they did. We know that there's a neurobiological element to all of this, that when we experience pleasure, we get hit with a shot of dopamine, that the, the reward pathways and the pleasure pathways of our brains are opened, and that our brains get bathed in these neurotransmitters it's how animals stay alive. Food and drink cause something to go off, an alarm to go off, and we want more of it. Physical intimacy, questions of procreation, these are the kinds of things which we're indulging in an Epicurean or hedonistic way. Our senses long for them. We are men and women that are filled with cravings. And I wanna just say this, a religion that does not deal with the lonely and desperate cravings of people is not worth our time. Thank God the Catholic faith, thank God Christianity does engage these deep questions. And the Eucharist itself is Jesus in God the Father's and the Holy Spirit's direct answer to these questions. Notice how often all through the scripture, these questions of physical intimacy, procreation, food and drink, all of these things which attract our senses, which engage our lower faculties, how often they're dealt with. From the very first pages, God creates man and woman and he bids them to be fruitful and multiply. He places them in a garden filled with food, and he says, you may eat from all of the trees of the garden. And then they look at the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the only one forbidden them, and they find it delightful and attractive for food. And then when they partake of it, they find that they're naked, although before they were naked without shame, and they hide themselves. A few pages later, we read the story of Noah who partakes of the fruit of the vine. He drinks deeply of it and he becomes drunk. He becomes drunk and his sons come. Shem, his son, comes and covers over his nakedness, his nakedness because he is drunk. In the Sinai Desert, the Israelites after the exodus are wandering for 40 years and it's a story all about their hunger and their thirst, all about their cravings in the desert which caused them to have rebellious hearts and God rescues them. He makes water come forth from the rock and manna to fall down from heaven. And there's the prophecy of Isaiah, the second chapter and the 25th chapter of Isaiah, which is all about how God will make a mountain rise up, which is higher than all the other mountains. This is Mount Zion. And what will he do upon it? The prophecy says he will fill it. All the nations will stream toward it and he will feed them with the choicest, juiciest meats and foods and beautiful, choice, succulent wines he will give to them. All through the Old Testament, we see these themes of nakedness and procreation and intimacy and food and drink. And then Jesus bursts on, onto the scene and he is laid in a manger in the feeding trough of an animal born in Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. When he begins his public ministry, he goes out into the desert and he does battle with the devil, quoting Deuteronomy to him in the midst of a fast, being seized by hunger. Angels bring him bread to eat. Where do angels get bread from? How does bread come into the desert? In Exodus 
or in the gospel. And then when Jesus leaves the desert after his temptation, where does he go? He goes straight to Cana to a wedding feast where a young boy and a young girl have become married and they're going to exchange their lives and their bodies and he makes water into wine. And then all through his public ministry, he's eating and drinking with sinners and he's touching, physical touch, all along, healing the sick, the blind, the deaf, the dumb, making the limbs of those who cannot walk to dance. In the sixth chapter of John, he multiplies the loaves and the fishes to feed the hungry crowd and then gives his teaching on the Eucharist. My flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. And at the Last Supper, the night before he dies, he eats and drinks with his apostles and he says to them, this is my body which is given for you. This is my blood poured out for you. And the next day he hangs upon the cross and he is naked because he is the bridegroom of the church. And he cries out before he dies, I thirst. Yesterday, in the Vatican, a man went into St. Peter's Basilica. Did you hear about this? Took off all his clothes and got up on the high altar of St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican to protest the war in Ukraine. An act of high sacrilege. But it was a double sacrilege because there is already a naked man on that altar. The bridegroom of the church is there and when John Lorenzo Bernini sculpted the high altar of St. Peter's Basilica, he melted down bronze from the dome of the Pantheon and he sculpted that altar in the form of a canopied bridal bed because the Eucharist is the place where Jesus the Son of God consummates his marriage with humanity, with redeemed humanity in the church, his bride. The themes are all through there. It's as though the Lord is trying to remind us of our spiritual reality. He's meeting us where we are. He's getting down underneath all of our cravings and he's lifting them up elevating us and reminding us that we are spiritual beings, that we're not a bunch of cows who come running when we hear the feed wagon come, not a bunch of pigs gathering around the slop pail or dogs whining for scraps from the table. We're not lions lunging into the corpse of a gazelle while the vultures circle overhead. We're not tomcats on the prowl or jackals in heat. We're animals, but we're not just animals. We're sons and daughters of God. And he feeds us with what St. Thomas Aquinas calls the bread of angels. And I just want to remind you that angels don't have bread. What's meant by the bread of angels is the kind of nourishment which is for the spiritual life which nourishes our minds and our wills and strengthens them such that our emotions and our senses come into order and we're made one again in wholeness and in holiness. He's reminding us, do this, he said, in memory of me. The great tragedy is that we forget the Eucharistic revival isn't just for all the people out there who don't believe, it's for you and me. Those of us who say that we're Eucharistic Catholics, we need revival, we need renewal, we need to be deepened and fortified in our belief in the church's teaching and in the Lord's presence because otherwise we forget. It's like that scene in Puccini's opera Tosca. This opera is written during the Napoleonic Wars, so it takes place in the year 1800. 
and the Pope has been banished and Rome is ruled by seven consuls and Napoleon's armies are on the way and Scarpia, who's the chief of police, finds himself in the great church of Sant'Andrea della Valle in Rome and he's, he's, he's plotting and scheming because he wants to catch this rebel who's on the run and he also wants to seduce this woman named Tosca and he figures out a way he, in which he can do both of them at the same time and so he's, he's in this reverie, he's, he's singing with rage and with lust and then all of a sudden while all of this is happening the blessed sacrament comes by in procession, a priest and altar servers come walking right by him, holding the monstrance with the blessed sacrament inside, and he falls to his knees, and he shouts out, Tosca mi fai dimenticare Dio. Tosca, you make me forget God. That's us. We've forgotten God. And the Lord wants to remind us, do this in memory of me. Don't forget who I am for you. This is my body. And don't forget who you are. You're not just a bunch of animals. There is another threat, of course, to our belief in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, which is beyond just pure hedonism or Epicureanism. It is a grave and serious challenge that mixes great good with grave evil and I don't know that we've seen the likes of it before. Maybe what could be best likened to it is the, the sort of everlasting affliction upon the human race of idolatry, but I'm not sure. What I'm talking about is a new phenomenon, very new in terms of the history of humanity, a new phenomenon that has become deeply widespread which engages in, a, in, a, in the same way as food and drink and physical intimacy are lower nature, but also engages and captivates and hijacks our higher nature in a way which is very perplexing and difficult to navigate, and also which, if we allow it, will disable our capacity for faith. And what I'm talking about is the internet, Social media, smartphones and tablets, the whole digital world in which we live. Why do I say that there's grave danger there? Well, uh, partly because it's been well proven now that all of this does the same thing with the reward pathways of our brains as has happened for, for millennia, for time immemorial with other physical pleasures. The internet is a hotbed for gambling addiction, shopping addiction, pornography pornography, and food pornography, which I didn't even know was a thing, but if you Google it, you get 53 million results. Food pornography. In other words, it's this, it's this pathway to a whole world which is mesmerizing to us and which draws us in. If you give a smartphone to a one-year-old, they know what to do with it. The engineers behind it have hacked the human mind. It's an extraordinary and very worrisome achievement. On the campus of the University of Mary in 2016, we saw a massive shift, as did just about every college campus in America. The freshmen who arrived in 2016 were less prepared than any class that any of us had ever seen to cope with the basic difficulties of life. We saw massive spikes in, in, uh, in depression, in anxiety, and mental health problems of all kinds. And as we looked for an answer, Dr. Jeannie Twenge from the University of California, San Diego, came out with a series of studies and others have replicated them since, just noting that that was the first group of people, the first cohort of college freshmen who had grown up never knowing what it was like to be without a cell phone. Okay, but I want to pause there, because if it was just about our lower faculties that we could deal with, but it's not just that. Every, just about every Catholic 
spends enough recreational time on the internet that we could easily go to mass every day and do a holy hour every day, but we don't want to. We'd rather be on the internet. Why? Here's why. Like nothing perhaps in all history, the spectacle of digital technology hacks into the transcendent aspect of the human person. We are spiritual beings. We are wired for contact with and communication with a vast invisible world. That's how we're put together. That's, that's how we move. We must be in contact in that way. And prayer and worship is the traditional way for human beings to achieve that spiritual transcendental and transcendent purpose. What digital technology has done is it's become an avatar, a counterfeit, a substitute for the spiritual life. It gives us the illusion when we partake of it that we are in fact in contact with a vast invisible world of great power that we are in contact with and in commerce with and communication with. It is a substitute or a counterfeit, an avatar for prayer. Monsignor Tom Richter is currently teaching a course on prayer on our campus, which all of you should take. You shouldn't come to talks by me. You should take his class. He's teaching one. Father Wayne Sattler, these are men who are deeply, deeply immersed in the interior life, and Father Richter teaches, Monsignor Richter teaches that we're always drinking in the invisible world. Human beings, as the Greeks said, are the only animals who look at the stars. We look at the stars. And we're always, Monsignor Richter says, we're always receiving from somebody's heart, either the heart of God or the heart of the enemy, who is bent upon our destruction, overflowing with malice. And if my thesis is right, that digital technology can, if misused, give us access to this other world, it's no wonder that young people fall into deep depression and even take their lives within months of getting their first cell phone. It's no wonder that all of the people who invented this technology in Silicon Valley give testimony that they won't let their own children anywhere near these devices which they created. It's not for nothing that Steve Jobs named his great project Apple and that the logo is an apple with a bite taken out of it. Do what Adam and Eve did and all will be well. Social media which should be this extraordinary thing to connect people all around the globe. Lost long relatives can FaceTime each other. Now, from here to Australia, it's wonderful. And yet, it can be a substitute for prayer. Prayer is what? It's taking our thoughts, our feelings and desires and relating them to God, holding them up to God. That's very much what happens in social media. In modern people who don't pray, they take their thoughts, feelings, and desires, and they put them on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Now, when we take our most intimate desires, our brokenness, our thoughts, our feelings, our, 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 our deep need, our love, our sorrow, when we take all of that and we hold it up to God or to the Blessed Mother or to the saints, we receive love and encouragement and mercy and consolation. When we do the same and hold it out, to other fallen human beings, most of whom are super angry anyway, because the internet can be an angry place, we open ourselves up to vast devastation. And so we find ourselves in this moment, in the midst of a revival in which I believe God is calling us back into our spiritual destiny and vocation. To live as men and women whose minds and hearts 
and emotions and senses are given over to God. Why does God go through all of the all of the great trouble of coming to us hidden under the forms of bread and wine? Why the mystery of the Eucharist? Why does he do it in this way? It's because he wants to meet us where we are and he wants relationship with us. This is what Shelley and Father Gross were saying this morning. He wants to console us and he wants us to console him. He wants relationship with us. He doesn't just want our service. And this is where we get confused about the spiritual life and about what it means to be a disciple. We think that God wants us to please him by serving him. And he does want our service, but he doesn't need it. He wants us. He wants us to say to him, putting aside all the pleasures of this world, putting aside all the distraction of our day-to-day -day lives and all of the, 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 the hurt and the, the, the craving that, that, that captivates our souls and that makes us so that we're not free. He wants to clear it all away such that he can be with us. And he's so humble about it that he makes himself less than we are. The humble form of a piece of bread, a chalice of wine, transformed into his body and his blood, hoping that we will say what he says to us. He wants us to say to him, this is my body given for you. This is my blood, it's yours, poured out for a thirsty world. This is my body, my blood, use me as you wish. Just let me to be with you. That great Eucharistic saint, Thomas Aquinas, illustrates this beautifully from that passage in his life. You know, of course, Thomas Aquinas had written the Mass of Corpus Domini at Orvieto, the first Corpus Christi feast and procession, and the, the Tanta Mergo, and the Pange Lingua, and the O Salutaris, and all these great Eucharistic hymns, he had composed them, and he wrote a treatise on the Blessed Sacrament. In 1273, after his second stint at the University of Paris, he was asked by the Dominicans to found a regency, a regency in Naples, and he went there and he was praying one day. He had finished a treatise on the Blessed Sacrament. He placed it on the altar and he sank into prayer and the crucifix spoke to him and said, Scripsisti bene da me, Toma. You have written well, Thomas, of the sacrament of my body and blood. What would you have in return? And famously, St. Thomas paused and thought and said, I will have thyself, only thyself, I want you. A couple of months later on the Feast of St. Nicholas in the same year, 1273, he was saying mass on the Feast of St. Nicholas and after that mass, he received a revelation in the midst of it. He said, I will write no more, everything I've done is straw. He recognized that God didn't want, God didn't want anything but him. He would use his writings, he would use his service, but he didn't need it. Jesus was playing a lover's game with Thomas when he asked him that question. What will you have in return? He was seeing if Thomas would change it into a fallen human transactional game. The teacher says, good job on your homework, do you want a star? The used car salesman says, good job buying that Cadillac. Would you like a toaster or a blender or a trip to Hawaii? Now, who would say to the teacher or to the used car salesman, I don't want that, I want you? That would be creepy. That would be strange. That's what Jesus wants. I want you. I want you. A friend of mine told me, <laughs> a friend of mine told me the story about when she met her husband. And at first they were friends before they began a little bit to flirt. This was in college. And they went out one, t one weekend to the lake with a bunch of friends. And they were sitting around and the sun had just set and it was getting cold. And so she sat down, she walked over to him and she sat down on the edge of his lawn chair. And she said to him, I'm cold. And he proceeded to get up and build an enormous fire. <laughs> it took him like an hour. 
a guy will do anything for a chance to light stuff on fire. And when he was done, he sat down in another lawn chair across the fire from her. This is us with Jesus. <laughs> he wants intimacy with us. He wants to be close to us. And instead, we're out building fires. I say this all the time to our students at the University of Mary. It's so important for us to realize that we're responsible for our lives, but we're not responsible all alone. This really cooks us in our spiritual lives. Serious Catholics think to themselves, okay, I know I've got to have a moral life. I know I've got to have a spiritual life. I have to get my act together. I've got to do this. And so then we, we set about, we try and do it, and we find that we're weak and we fall. We fall on our face again and again, and then we become discouraged, and we feel like we should just throw in the towel and not do anything at all, ever. And this is a, this is a great tragedy for us. And what we're missing is that God doesn't simply want our service. He doesn't need it. He'll use it, he's glad for it, but he wants us. And we're not simply responsible for our lives, we're co-responsible. He's responsible too. And it's right that God should be responsible. Each one of us has been given a life. We were born into a family that we didn't choose, probably not a perfect family. We have circumstances, things that happened to us when we were small, good and bad that we didn't have any control over. But God was there. We have things in our temperament, in our personality that he put there. We're not simply responsible for our lives. He's responsible too. And what he wants when we come to him in prayer, especially when we approach him in the blessed sacrament and he appeals to all our cravings, our hungers, our thirst, our desire for intimacy, when we come to him in the blessed sacrament, he wants to co-conspire with us about our lives. He wants to know what we're going through. That haunting question should haunt us every day. How much would God know about our lives if he only knew what we had told him? How important it is for us to waste time with God in the Blessed Sacrament. He wants to sit on the edge of our lawn chair. He wants to take us in his arms. And otherwise we forget. A friend of mine told me this story about forgetfulness and the Eucharist. Not long ago, very recently in the Fujian province of China, there was a man who was hosting an underground mass in his home. The Catholic faith is illegal there except for the patriotic official government church. And the priests who are in communion with Rome move through this province in fear for their lives. They have to celebrate mass in homes in secret and while the Mass is being celebrated, there are lookouts to watch for guards who are patrolling, looking for these underground Masses. And one night, a Mass was taking place in this man's home, and the lookout came in and said, the police are coming, and everyone ran. The priest ran, all the people ran, but the man had nowhere to go because it was his home. He was arrested and he was taken to a prison where for two weeks they tortured him day and night trying to get him to give up the location and the name of the priest. They took a cattle prod and they would apply it to different parts of his body, administering electric shocks to him. Just tell us the name of the priest, tell us where he is but he wouldn't do it because he knew that if he did, there would be no more Eucharist for him or his family and he didn't know when another priest would be able to come. And so finally they let him go home. Very soon afterward, he received passage to the United States, came here to our country 
and he settled in the northeast part of the country. And at first, he and his family were overjoyed. He could, he could walk down the street and go to mass every single day. He could go to adoration like Shelley Presler at three in the morning. Todd, I feel like I should mention your name seven times. You're the great hero of this conference. <laughs> he could go to adoration and mass whenever he wanted. And it was amazing. But our nation is also the land of opportunity. It's a place where you can get ahead if you work hard. And he found that out too. And pretty soon, pretty soon he thought, if I extend my hours, I can make a little bit more. And he, he would send his family off to daily mass and he wouldn't go. Pretty soon he would make time and a half on weekends. And so he would miss a Sunday mass here and there. And before long, he was going only on Christmas and Easter. And the friend of mine who told me this story knew a friend who knew his priest. And that pastor said that the last Easter, he didn't even go. What a sobering story. Here's a man who was a hero for the Eucharist, who was tortured for Jesus Christ, present body, blood, soul, and divinity in the sacred host. And what communist China and torture were unable to do, our culture was, our Epicurean culture was able to do and it didn't even have to try. We have to allow our hearts during this Eucharistic revival to be swept up in a newfound love of Jesus in the Eucharist. Our hearts should glow with love with him, allowing him to be with us through thick and thin in all things. And then we can be a source of renewal for the whole rest of the world, so hungry, so thirsty, so dying for intimacy, for love, mercy, and truth. Pray with me. Oh Jesus, present to us in the Eucharist, we give you great thanks for your kindness, your affection, your desire for us. You give us your body and your blood because you know that we would never be satisfied with anything less than yourself. You quench our thirst you satiate our hunger. Every physical desire grows quiet in the presence of your overwhelming love. Sweep us off our feet. Consecrate our hearts to you. Take our brokenness and put us back together such that our minds might soar with delight at your truth and knowing you, such that our wills might burn with deep love, true charity. Cause our passions, our emotions, and our senses to be purified and brought into alignment with your truth, your love, your goodness, your beauty. And may this Eucharistic revival be here in our Diocese of Bismarck, throughout our land, and around the world, a clarion call of the interior life. Help us not to forget you, but every day to do what you asked in remembrance of you. We ask this in your most holy name, amen. Thanks, everybody.
Well, I get to work with him every single day. <laughs> always looking forward. Andiamo, let's go with him. And it's always good because it's, it's for your soul. And I think the one thing that I, that I always take away something beautiful from Monsignor Shea, but it leads into our next announcement. I want you to hear it very closely. Um, is we're all building fires for, for whatever reason we want. And I think... So often it, we're doing that to avoid the very thing that we need the most, which is to unite our hearts to Christ. And it can be the social media thing, whatever that might be, and that's the beauty of moving into a holy hour now is because we get to ask the Holy Spirit to show us where it is that we want to build fires more so we can stop avoiding the meaning we need with uniting our heart to Christ. The beauty of this Eucharistic revival is there's a beautiful gradation to it this next year, it's focused in the parish. This is kind of a culmination of it being focused in the diocese. Now it's moving to the National Eucharistic Congress announcement. I've got something really special that I want to announce to you that I want you to listen close to and, and really pray and think about, is this something that I should do? In partnership with the Diocese of Bismarck, we at the University of Mary want to extend a warm invitation for all of you to join us on a pilgrimage to the 10th National Eucharistic Congress next summer. In collaboration with the diocese, the University of Mary has obtained 300 tickets or six buses worth of tickets to what will surely be one of the most significant gatherings of Catholics in our lifetime. We leave from Bismarck on July 16th, returning on July 22nd. We're talking possibly 70 to 80,000 Catholics in one gathering in Indianapolis at Lucas Oil Stadium. We'll have overnights on the road in Minneapolis and in Chicago. So it's not this all the way through 24 hours straight in a bus, for those of you that get worried about that. Two stops, Minneapolis, Chicago, and great downtown housing in Indianapolis. If you're interested in learning more or registering right away, Please visit umary.edu slash NEC. That stands for National Eucharistic Congress. umary.edu slash NEC. I'll help you. Members from the diocese will help you. We'll make sure you get information on that. You'll find additional information about our plans for the trip. If you go to this website, a detailed cost breakdown and everything you need to get started on the registration process. That's again next summer, July, 20, July 16th through July 22nd. We hope you can make it. We're very, very excited, and we'd love to have you come along. Next summer, National Eucharistic Congress, mark your calendars. That won't allow you to build a fire. That will be something very, very special. And so now we'll have a few minute break here. We want to start at 2.35. Um, we're going to have a Eucharistic procession. We will end up moving Jesus from Hall A to Hall B. And then we'll have a procession through here. And so it would be best for you to be in here. Because that's where we're going to end up. And that's where the procession will happen. And so start making your way back here, please, by about 2.33. So we can start fresh at 2.35. And you will hear music begin Music, once Jesus is in here, you can look on page 15 in your booklet and you can sing along during the procession. Um, I want to just make sure you're aware, incense will begin to be used here. And so if, you're, um, if that is hard for you, we'll be using it during this time and during Mass as well. And I just wanted to make sure that you were aware. Once our Lord is on the altar and we have a little bit of a procession happening, we will have a holy hour with our Lord till 345. Okay? And then that will move into our mass later on. And so I'll have more announcements at 345 after our holy hour. So a few minutes now to break. Use the restroom. Start heading back in here in about six or seven minutes. Again, round of applause for Monsignor James Shea.